right. Good morning, and thank you to everyone who's joining the League of Women Voters of Alabama for this live Zoom panel. Um, if you have any questions for the panelists, um, please do use the chat feature to submit your questions for later, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the discussion. Um, today's event it will be live streamed on the League of Women Voters of Alabama Facebook page. On Facebook, our username is LWVAL, and the link will be dropped into the chat. Please share it with your networks. And if you would like to view or share today's presentation at a later date, it will be available afterwards on the League's YouTube channel at LWB Alabama under the Voter Education Playlist. This morning's panel is on election integrity, specific, specifically about what's going on with voter roll maintenance in Alabama. At the very start of his term, Alabama's Secretary of State Wes Allen fulfilled a campaign promise he made to withdraw Alabama from participation in ERIC, the Elections Registration Information Center. In its place, the Secretary's office is launching AVID, the Alabama Voter Integrity Database. ERIC, and now AVID, is the system by which Alabama meets the federal law requiring accurate voter rolls to have secure and fair elections. Today, we're going to talk to a panel of experts who will discuss the importance of voter roll maintenance, the challenges of standing up a new Alabama-based system, and what election security and accessibility advocates need to be watching for during the rollout of AVID. It is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists, Silver, Sylvia Albert is the Director of Voting and Elections for Common Cause. In this role, she works to press for reforms that expand access to the ballot for eligible voters and promote fair representation in our democracy. Sylvia has more than a decade of professional experience in public interest law and public policy campaigns, expanding ballot access, reducing barriers to participation, and combating voter intimidation among historically disenfranchised communities. She's also done extensive work on fair housing issues, serving as a program analyst and an advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity in the Obama administration. Adam Ambrogi serves as Chief of External Affairs at the League of Women Voters of the United States. In that role, he leverages his experience in strategy, vision, and relationship development to support the growth of the League's impact and influence to strengthen democracy. Prior to joining the League, he served as Director of the Elections and Voting Program at Democracy Fund. He also previously worked as Chief Counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules and Administration. Before his work on the Rules Committee, Adam served as Special Assistant and Counsel for Commissioner Ray Martinez III of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, where he helped build that agency, distributed $3 billion to modernize elections, blocked restrictive voting policies, and educated election officials on the requirements of the Help America Vote Act. Ann Mitchell Brown is the Curtis O. Lyles III Professor of Political Science at Auburn University and is a founding editor of the Journal of Elections Administration Research and Practice. She is widely published and her work as a researcher, evaluator, trainer, and consultant focuses on applied projects around the country centering on election administration and community-based problem solving. She serves on the board of directors of the National Association of Election Officials and has also helped board and held board and leadership positions at the university, in state government, and in nonprofit organizations. Thank you all so much for being with us. And there is so much material to cover this morning, so we're gonna jump right in. Let's start at the beginning with some background, Mitchell. Give us a quick overview of the Help America Vote Act and tell us about the changes it mandated in voter roll maintenance. Yeah, it, since we're talking about voter roll maintenance, I think we have to start with the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, um, which the, the purpose of that was to expand access to voting and it, it did a number of things. It designated a chief election official in each state, for most states, that's the Secretary of State. It made voter registration possible for all states for 
um, citizens who, in a way that they didn't have to register in person at the time, there were some states that required in-person registration. It expanded the ways that people could register um, through mail registration forms by requiring states to accept a federal mail registration form and by having registration available at all of the human service agencies in the state, like the DMV. That's why it's sometimes referred to as motor voter. Uh, it, it also mandated central voter lists, um, exclusive to itself, which becomes really important. And it created a standardized removal process, so there was no discrimination in the removal process. Then fast forward nine years, we get the Help America Vote Act, which was uh, largely a response to problems that we saw um, in particular places in the country um, for the with the 2000 election. And HAVA then provided more resources to modernize election equipment. It required provisional ballots be allowed across the country for voters. It also um, then centralized state voter files even more, um, national, it created a national clearinghouse, and um, it, it created the EAC body to be that national clearinghouse, the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, uh, but it gave it no regulatory authority. And so the environment we're working in today is um, an environment that is structured by these two federal laws. Um, Adam, as a, you know, you worked on HAVA, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Um, uh, I was uh, one of the first staffers in at the tiny baby agency, the Election Assistance Commission uh, that Mitchell mentioned. And, um, you know, it was clear that there were a lot of tasks that uh, Congress gave the small agency. But one of the key ones that I think everyone hoped that it would work on because it's the entry point to voter registration is the requirement in the Help America Vote Act that there be a single statewide electronic voter registration list that folks at the statewide level could see and engage with, that folks at the local level could exchange with. There was no more registrations in on cardstock, uh, county by county, city by city. Um, there was one single list. And so that change was 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 monumental. And it was something that was a challenge and that many states, some states had gone in that direction already. It was a, considered growing as the best practice in the field, but there were many states that had not. And the Help America Vote Act and the EAC during the first couple of years really focused a lot on trying to figure out how to help the states comply with that mandate. Some states did it from the bottom up where there's a little bit more engagement on the county and city level, uh, feeding information to the statewide list. Some states did it what they call top down, uh, where a lot more uh, of the structure was engaged from, uh, from the statewide level uh, down to the local level. But, um, uh, but the focus, uh, so much of the focus during the first couple of years of that agency was guidance, information, distribution of funds for folks to hire smart people to figure that out. There were some failures to be sure, um, but there were also, I think, uh, a movement in the right direction uh, by most of the states. So, uh, but totally agree with Mitchell's overview and framework for it. So as election professionals, we're talking here about voter list maintenance or voter role maintenance. But sometimes in our advocacy circles, we hear the phrase voter purges to describe voters being removed from the rolls. Mitchell, is there a difference between voter roll maintenance and purging? I, I, um, I, I think it's two words that describe the same process um, with one of them being pejorative. Um, that there's a, a federal law that requires voter list maintenance and requires it in particular ways. So it's not like election officials could go in and drop out half of the people on their rolls. What, what we get from the federal law is a requirement that a voter on the list affirmatively remove themselves. If um, and, and then there are other ways for them to be removed. And, and so if on the Social Security death index, they're listed as someone who has passed away, they can be removed. 
Um, otherwise, what has to happen and, and what we get from these federal laws is this, what, what folks will refer to as the NVRA process. There's some indication that a person has moved, have, has left the address where they are registered. When the election office gets that information, they are then required to send, um, in the case of the state of Alabama, they send a postcard to the address of the person that they have on file. And, and then one of three things can happen. The, the person can respond to that postcard and say, no, I'm still at this address and I want to be registered. And their registration is updated and they're fine. The, the second thing that can happen is that they can respond and say, this, this is correct, I have moved. In which case, when they positively affirm that they have moved, then the um, voter registrar can remove them from those roles. The third thing that happens when these postcards are sent out, and this is the thing that happens most often, is that there's no response. The postcard might be returned by the post office as undeliverable or nothing happens, in which case um, these people are put on what's referred to as, in some places, as inactive status. And um, when, when you're on the inactive status, you can still go vote. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to go vote. But when you, in Alabama, when you show up to the polls, what you have to do is update your information in order to be able to vote. Um, and if there's a problem with that update, then you can cast a provisional ballot and then go through the curing process to make sure that ballot is counted. Um, if neither of those things didn't happen, then the person stays on the inactive list for two federal election cycles or four years, and then um, and then they are able to legally be removed from the list. And that piece is what folks will refer to sometimes as a purge. Um, so, Sylvia, do you mind weighing in on that? Because um, you do work on the advocacy side. Um, do you think that how we talk about it matters? Um, I definitely think that how we talk about it matters. I, I will have a um, slight, I, I will say I have a slightly different take in, in that I don't think list maintenance and purging is the same thing. I think list maintenance is the proper orderly removal of, um, of ineligible voters um, or persons who should not be on the rolls. I think what can often happen when list maintenance isn't done properly is when we get the purge. So when um, the proper security protocols aren't taken into account or proper matching criteria aren't used or uh, the reason that um, those initial mailers are sent out are um, improper, then you lead to people being removed um, that have the right to stay on the, on the voter rolls. So that, that is how I would define the difference between um, list maintenance and purging. Um, and we will definitely get to that when the process doesn't work well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Eric now. Um, Mitchell, you work directly with election administration officials across the country, including until recently in Alabama. Um, so if we can talk about the functional part of Eric first, um, what is the actual work that is done to keep the voter rolls up to date? Um, what did it look like before Eric? I, you already talked about that a little bit. And what changed with Eric? So um, prior to Eric, there was a, a an effort by a collection of states to share and compare lists to do voter list maintenance called interstate cross-check. Um, Eric was developed out of, I, I believe, a Pew initiative initially and um, became a freestanding organization of member states that volunteered to come together and share their lists with each other through a central hub. And um, th through the ERIC system, then they share their lists, they, up they upload or, or share these lists every 60 days. And so what you have is a constant effort to share information about who's registered where, try and match up names so you can determine if someone has moved or registered in a different place. And um, then you can engage that in VRA process to keep the voter lists up to date and as clean as possible. Now, Adam, who, who runs ERIC right now? And Sylvia talked about the member states, but who really runs it? Yeah, it, the, the member states are the folks that um, are the governing body. And, you know, it's the board of the directors. It's the governance of of the system um, because it, it's an interstate element that was created. It, it has a, I think a 501 C three status um, uh, just because of the nature. It's not 
technically a governmental entity by itself because it's between the states. Uh, but, you know, when, when, when Pew conceived this, because election officials were having challenges with, um, uh, with, with, with the, the voter registration rolls, as well as making sure that there was access and integrity in the voter registration rolls, they knew that, that there was a, a sort of an ideological fight going on in the space. Um, that related to voter registration and that there were um, there are folks that were traditionally on the left that well, concerned about making sure that eligible folks that were not given access to the rolls were able to be found and added to the, the voter registration rolls appropriate. There are concerns of folks on the right, people uh, moving between states or potentially double voting or being registered twice in in the same state. And so you had this dynamic where states on the right were states on the right were were pushing for integrity-ish type things and states on the left were pushing for access things and um uh, there was a, a potential solution that actually could improve the entire system of access and integrity because I think most reasonable folks no, we need both in, in the system. And that, that combination of technology to both ensure that we, that only folks within a state who are eligible to vote are on the rolls and folks that are eligible to vote within the state but are not on the rolls get on the rolls um, uh, is the genesis for why Pew and the initial member states created ERIC. They also, you know, I'll say they were very cautious. The initial states that were excited about this, as well as the Pew, initial Pew team to both um, get the smartest technology people involved. They spent a lot of money in trying to make sure that the that all of the dynamics related to these core and tricky election administration problems, these data problems, these security problems were solved before we, we got going on, on the ERIC system. And they were also really mindful of the ideological balance, which I think is key in this entire conversation uh, in that they, with, with the, the growth of Eric and growth of the member states, um, both the early member states, as well as those that had been involved in, in engaging in Eric, ensured that there were, you know, Noah's Ark for lack of a better term, there, two by two, a right-leaning state and a left-leaning state would enter in, would see that balance and be able to sort of show that this is a focus on lifting the rising tide, lifting all ships, making sure that access and integrity are part of the process. Um, and, and, and that's really the balance. If, you know, for, for the right leaning states, you got your integrity, but you also ensured that there were folks that were eligible but unregistered that were being added to the list because of the member requirements of the ERIC system. For the left-leaning states, they got that access for the eligible but unregistered folks, and they were going to be reached out to using a state process that's more likely to have people say, yes, I want to be registered and I'm eligible. But they also had the integrity portions of the of, of, of the membership that ensured that, you know, that there was not going to be uh, folks moving outside of the state that were still in the roles, that list maintenance was important for those states. So the, the 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 key reason to have both access and integrity, to have left leaning and right leaning um, states at at the same time, was part of the genius of this. And and you know that 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 was sort of the how this this thing grew and how you got some both very progressive and very conservative secretaries of state that like this idea, that support this idea. And some still do, but um, we're, we're also obviously in a challenging moment. Um, I'd like to clarify some other information. Um, Secretary Allen has been out speaking about AVID versus ERIC. Um, and just this week, um, and Sylvia, I'll send this question to you. Um, Secretary Allen was on an 1819 interview, which is a state-based um, information organization. Um, and he claimed that prior to AVID, Alabama didn't have access to national death records from the Social Security Administration. Is that true? I mean, did we really not have access to that information with Eric? Um, so it was through Eric, I believe, and you know what, Adam might have the exact um, information on, but Eric actually compared 
the social security of all the participating states, the postal service records, social security death records, um, and um, and provided that information to um, to the states. So I'm not sure why he would say that they didn't. Perhaps he was thinking that he should have, that Alabama itself should have access to everything. Whereas Adam said, the information was put into a central location lot, with lots of security and lots of data analysis was done to pull the information of the relevant people in your state who needed to be taken, who, pay, who needed to be removed from the list. Um, I won't go into all of the, the, the propaganda disinformation that has come out about Eric. Um, but I mean, I just, I have to wonder where is it coming from? And why, why is all this being pushed out, this really bad information about the funding, the founding, the processes? Um, and do you have any thoughts on where it's coming from? I'll start and maybe kick it off to Sylvia. Just, I'm sure that there's a lot that I've missed. You know, there's been some good reporting out there on, um, uh, you know, both, I think, ProPublica, I think, documented. Um, uh, there are a couple of uh, other good pieces. I think VoteBeat um, have, has had some really good reporting on how this emerged. And, you know, th there does seem to be a concerted effort um, from uh, to, to apply pressure on some of these conservative um, or right-leaning uh, chief election officials uh, because some folks don't like the access provision. They don't like the balance. They don't like the agreement that was the core portion of the agreement uh, for the start of Eric. And so um, there was a Gateway Pundit uh, article that uh, that apparently, you know, attempted to sort of show that this was, um, you know, some sort of trap that it somehow pulled the wool over uh, the eyes of many very conservative secretaries of state for all of these years, um, you know, which uh, again, does, does not seem to uh, pass muster. Um, there also did seem to be from some reporting uh, meetings um, of only right-leaning and conservative uh, chief election offices right before and in advance of recent Eric board meetings that you know the reporting seems to indicate that there was an attempt to apply pressure um for these folks to leave eric um and some of the stated reports from certain secretaries of state mean was was around getting away from the mandate that they reach the eligible but unregistered uh voters which again it's a key part of of this process of the balance you know you get you get what you really like which is the integrity and you get what you may not care for which is the access but it's still important this is like the it, the system was not created to be an integrity only system it was to improve the entire process of voter registration the access and integrity and so I would encourage folks to go and 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 look at 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 what is being the the push uh, and and quite frankly some of the conservative election officials maybe in ohio in iowa and other places that that said that they really liked eric and it was the best system that they could use to ensure integrity and a month later they they left it with no real answer or 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 legitimate response as to why they changed their mind so quickly uh, it's it's curious sylvia what 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 didn't i say yeah i mean you know i i it's just I, the political games. I mean, that's the reality. It got caught up in the, unfortunately, as, as Adam spoke to, this is a great bipartisan um, organization. And, you know, when you're um, a politician who's, who's um, appealing to their base, they, you know, the, the, the bipartisanship doesn't, doesn't get people real excited. So um, I, I do think it just, it just, um, it just fell victim to kind of, you know, political ridiculousness. Um, Mitchell, can I ask you from the, you know, the, the election administrator side? I mean, are, is there any, any there there? Are there legitimate concerns about Eric, things that could or should be improved? I, I, um, I think that most of the election administrators I've spoken with have been very happy with Eric. Um, I, I, I think actually the political story is the real story. 
um, the, the person who was connected most tightly with starting Eric and leading Eric and leading the bipartisan movement um, came out vociferously against Trump and very publicly. And I think that even though he, when he did this, he'd removed himself from Eric formally, um, the connection was still there. People, you know, people knew who he was. And, and so I think he became a, um, Eric became a victim of that. Um, and Sylvia, let me ask you about um, the automatic voter registration, because um, it's something else that our Secretary of State said, um, and I'll, I'll read what he said. Um, the left, one of their holy gra grails is really automatic voter registration. And he implied that Eric is a vehicle to force that policy of automatic voter registration through. I mean, is there any truth to that that you know of? And what's problematic about ABR? Um, yeah, no, there's, I mean, uh, I can't imagine how Eric could be used for automatic voter registration when automatic voter registration are state-based um, laws that provide for further access and help modernize an out-of-date registration system by ensuring that people um, are, you know, given the opportunity to register um, or are registered um, when interacting with, you know, with uh, government agencies like the DMV. Um, there is no uh, reason that, uh, you know, there, there's no in, there's no way to um, automatically register somebody because they were in some ERIC database, right? It's just, a, it's a completely different system. Um, but um, I think they are both um, good systems which attempt to modernize the elections um, infrastructure and um, eliminate a lot more, you know, we've, uh, of the individual actions, we've moved into, you know, technology has advanced quite a lot. Um, and so I think both of these systems were made to um, really modernize the out of date registration system, modernize our roles and um, increase access um, for citizens. So let's, let's move into Abbott, which is Alabama. Alabama's new system. So for whatever the reasons that they were created, Alabama has officially withdrawn from ERIC. Um, the new system called AVID, and I'll say again, the Alabama Voter Integrity Database. Um, and Secretary Allen said that we are the first state in the nation to implement a system like this. Um, Mitchell, what is it that's unique or innovative about AVID? I, um, well, what makes it unique is that it, it's the first real response to do a concerted effort to clean up the roles um, outside of ERIC uh, with other states and with other information sharing. AVID is set up theoretically to help clean up the roles by bringing in information from four sources. Uh, one is comparing the existing list to the um, driver's license and non-driver's license list in the state for to looking for movers. The second is to then use NCOA information for this is mail forwarding, right, to clean up the list. The third then is the creation of MOUs um, with the contiguous states. And so that's, um, AVID is set up to use the contiguous states to compare voter registration lists. Uh, now, now that we, they talk about using all of the contiguous states, but they only have two MOUs currently in place. They have done um, the analysis for one of those states, that's Tennessee, and they are getting ready to do the analysis for a second state, and that's Mississippi. But the idea is that not all of the contiguous states where Alabama residents are more likely to go to or come from, um, not all of those states were part of ERIC. And if movers are more likely to be regional, then the, the theory behind this is that we ought to get more clean, better information by using all of these contiguous states. And then the fourth piece is the Social Security Death Index. Though I would say that um, we still don't have access to the Social Security Death Index. So that, that hasn't happened yet. I think there's, there's discussion about all of these things as if they're ongoing. Um, but, but we haven't yet gotten access to that. And we've only done a comparison with one state so far. Another, I think, key difference between the way Eric works and the way Abbott's going to work is that Eric um, pulls and compares information every 60 days. And the Abbott system, when it is fully up and running, is designed to do that, compar that comparison on an annual basis. 
Um, so one of the one of the concerns was that um, the twenty five states plus DC that were included in Eric didn't necessarily include the states that border Alabama. Um, so for the first time, you know, once these MOUs are signed and the information is shared, we will have data exchange with our four border states, and I mean that must be a positive. Don't it, it, would you say, Mitchell? Um, yeah, it's it's certainly touted that way. Hey, Adam, did you want to chime in? You see my twitch of the head a little bit. I mean, there's the theory and then there's the practice. Um, this stuff is incredibly difficult. It took, there, there's an indication that the software that was behind Eric, even the startup to, to, to get version 1.0 was, was $2 million and it took years to be able to do right because, because that's easy, but because it is hard not only need to have great and deep data science, computer science expertise, but also bring in folks that really know election administration um, and, and, and know how to do this matching stuff in a way that is not over-inclusive, that would result in some sort of over-inclusive purge, as Sylvia mentioned, or under-inclusive, meaning it doesn't actually do the thing that you want it to do and remove and identify potential um, other folks in the space. Um, I think the issue that we should all be asking is like, like, where's the there there with Avid, right? We have a two page, um, very top level um, uh, information page on the Alabama Secretary of State's website. And we have some framework about what it's done. Some reporting has shown that there is a three page MOU that uh, was signed, I think with, uh, with Georgia, I think I've seen the Alabama and Georgia MOU and it's really pretty vague and really top level. And there's so many, you know, you read it and you're like, okay, none of these terms are defined. The change from registration from, you know, as, as Mitchell mentioned from every 60 days to once a year, uh, I think is certainly a decrease, you know, given how frequent folks move at, with, in the numbers with the states like, like Alabama. I also do think that um, part of what was made Eric smart is that they were able to figure out different paths of, of movers um, and where folks go from state to state. For example, when f folks leave at, uh, New York, there's a clear pattern between New York and Florida. Is Florida right next to New York? No. But there, there, there are movements that are not contiguous that, that smart data folks can figure out. And so to me, we don't know enough about AVID. Um, we have not seen that information uh, emerge. The uh, MOU that was publicly reported between Alabama and the state of Georgia is really top level and vague in so many ways and in ways that uh, you know that Eric was was not vague. You know the, the the Eric website has many pages on technology, on security, on the agreements between members, on what's responsible. This is it's very limited what we have, and so um, I would like to believe that the contiguous states piece would be a a positive. But we just don't know enough about what is actually going to happen with Avid, and it just hasn't been shared on 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 the site. So. Um, so I'm going to get to all of the stuff that we don't know in a minute, but Mitchell, what can you tell us about the pieces of it that are currently operational? What is moving forward and what is functioning right now? So what the state has publicly um, said that they've done is they've done the um, driver's license and non-driver's license comparison and identified uh, slightly over 8,000 people from that who there was a discrepancy between their driver's license address and their voter registration address. They've done an NCOA look and comparison and identified over 30,000 people from that. And they have done the Tennessee match and identified about 8,500 people from that. And, and so that that is what has been done so far that they've reported. And what happens then, so so we're talking 46,000 people. Um, what, what happens at this point is then the NVRA process gets, the removal process gets triggered. 
And so the information at the state level is sent to the appropriate county and the appropriate county sends that MVRA removal postcard to trigger that process. Um, what, so what is the impact of this on local elections officials? Um, what changes have they seen? What changes can they expect to see? I would think within the Alabama system, the changes, the real changes are going to be um, slightly less activity because you don't have the 60 day updates and the reports that get generated from it. But when there is activity, you know, one of the big questions is, is it, you know, how, how many names were generated from the ERIC process? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. The, at the local level, the process is still exactly the same as it always was. So um, full transparency to everybody who's with us. Um, you know, there was a lot of questions that I had that all of our panelists said, we just don't know the answers to that yet. Um, so I'm going to go through some of them um, just so that everybody knows what we don't know and can start thinking about how to get answers to those questions. And if I say something that you do know, feel free to raise your hand and we'll let you address it. Um, do we know anything about Alabama's statistical analysis capabilities for correctly identifying and eliminating duplicate records with Abbott? Um, what I do know is that the internal IT staff from the election department runs these and that as a byproduct of move, creating the AVID system, um, they have more than doubled their staff in order to have the capacity to do this. That's all I know. Okay, so he is standing by his no third party idea to bring yes. all the talent in house. Yes. Um, do we know anything about their data security measures? Do we know anything about the cost? Oh, Adam, go ahead. In, in the MOU um, with Georgia, there's some reference that the, the parties, meaning the Alabama Secretary of State and the Georgia Secretary of State, and I assume it will be similar for the other states, are using um, industry standard um, cryptographic solutions and a password. Um, so I'm glad that they've got the password. Um, uh, and, but uh, that was the that was the the framework in the MOU that that attempted to explain some of the security capabilities. Um, but but again, you know, having Microsoft data and software folks spend a couple of years and two million dollars on it versus eight months, and you know, I, I'm glad that they've doubled the staff. But um, you know, having more transparency and having a greater understanding of who, what, how, what advice they're getting from both data people, from election officials, um, I think would be really, really useful. We also know the state has Albert sensors. Not all the states do. Um, so, and if you want me to say anything technical about that, I'm not able to. <laughs> um, so with this significant, um, significantly more staff, um, and I'm guessing, you know, equipment, servers, technology, um, do we know anything about what this is costing Alabama? I mean, the only thing that I've seen the secretary talk about is $5,000 for the social security death data and 7,000 for the national change of address files. But there's got to be more to it than that. Do we know? I mean, obviously there's going to be staff costs. Um, okay. The, the, um, other thing, the other thing, Stephanie, is that when you think of the process of how Eric did where there was secure hashing of data out and every state got a response back from the Eric system, there was one review. Now, every time that you're going to get voter registration information and driver's license information, it will be between all of the Alabama state list and one other state and then the other state and the, the matching will have to go state by state as opposed to taking all of the ERIC members and looking at it and giving a report back as to the potential double voters or double registrants. Um, and so the amount of assessment uh, that needs to happen 
is a one-to-one -one as opposed to having all of the assessment happening and the report being being given. So the complexity of this uh, and the amount of time uh, is, you know, again, I'm not a data scientist, I am not a computer scientist, but looking at why they needed to create the ERIC system to begin with, this is why. So Alabama has decided to go on its own. Um, compliance with the NBRA and with HAVA was all built into ERIC in a very sophisticated way. Um, so Sylvia, um, what are some healthy concerns that we should have about Alabama setting up its own voter roll maintenance system? What should we be looking for? Um, well, I mean, to, right, to the obvious, right, we don't know the security um, protocols, and we also don't know what matching criteria they are using. Um, that is so important. There are people with the same name who live in the same house, and um, there's this lovely uh, um, study about how if 23 people are in the same room, it's either 23 or 27 people in the same room, there is a 50% chance that two people have the same birthday or something ridiculous like that. But basically the odds are actually really high that you're in the room with somebody who has the same birthday. And so when you leave, when you use really weak matching criteria, this really opens up um, a huge black hole. Um, and we know that um, uh, especially in immigrant communities, there are certain last names that are just more common. And so, um, and so, you know, for example, I'm sure everybody knows somebody from Korea whose last name is Kim, right? So um, when um, in, in these uh, communities, um, you're just much, much more likely to have a false uh, match if you're not using all the right uh, matching criteria, all the right security protocols. Um, and so the concern is just that more and more people will be put into the pipeline uh, to be removed who are um, actually eligible voters who um, should not be. Um, and I'll come back to you in just a minute um, to discuss um, some of the challenges that other states have had. Um, but Adam, let me ask you, are there any other states that are doing this work on their own that are succeeding? I mean, the removal and the push to remove uh, states from from Eric happened in you know you know between Louisiana I think was the the first uh, very end of last year um, uh, and and then there were sort of these these meetings and applied pressure in in February and you know we saw some the the, the other states that have left Eric um, just over you know six months or so ago. Um, uh, you know, I think that we've heard from Ohio that there's a new system that's being developed. Uh, I believe there's public reporting that Missouri is just going to go back and do its own sort of check and stay, you know, really, you know, just use the list maintenance processes that um, that it had in the past. But th there's also a lot of reporting that these states are saying we wish other states would uh, share our data just so we could get it and then clean our lists. And we're like, well, that was the system that you all left uh, that did it pretty well, did it pretty cheaply, um, but uh, exhibited a balance that, you know, folks removed themselves from. And so um, we we will be able to, the, the, the interesting thing and the sort of the challenging thing for the states that have chosen to leave and, you know, I, Jeanette Senegal from the League and I wrote about this in an election law blog piece, is that the NVRA, as well as other federal laws, make it pretty clear that you have to keep your records as far as the processes by which you choose to do these removal, these voter registration list removals um, uh, anywhere between two years or depending on DOJ requirements. A, a, almost a permanent requirement that you that you keep the standards, the statistics, the materials related to policy for removal under NVRA, which this stuff has to cons has to involve for a long time for access by litigants, by DOJ, by other folks, uh, and we'll be able to tell whether or not Eric was a better way to accurately remove folks and add folks to the list. Or, or whether you know this this system of creating your own technology in a couple of months and seeing how it works, whether whether that is the uh, more effective way to ensure access and integrity. I do think, and I'll throw into this, you know, Secretary of State uh, Raffensperger from Georgia 
who has been, uh, I think, alone um, as someone who's both outspoken and defensive of the Eric system um, as, as, as a conservative, um, uh, he, he really has, has, has pushed back on his, on his colleagues who have left and said that if you want something that actually is going to stand up for integrity for the system and make sure that you, you are able to appropriately remove folks from the list, this is the system to use. And so he, you know, he, he's really pushed back on this framework. And so there's, there's a, there, there's a partisan reflection as to how to remove folks and, and what the right thing to do is. And then there's, there's questions about whether folks who care about election integrity know the right way to make it happen. And, and in my judgment, you know, Georgia is that if you care about integrity, utilizing and maintaining the ERIC system uh, is still out, but we'll find out over time, you know, whether or not these new systems are working or not. But there, there are some cautionary tales in the past, and I wanted to ask you to um, tell us what happened in Kansas with cross check, Sylvia. Sure. So, um, you know, um, Mitchell said that you uh, did speak to this being the first attempt um, to get out of Eric, but it's actually not the first attempt instead of Eric. Um, Kansas tried a similar system called cross check. Uh, it was uh, touted as the, al the alternative to Eric um, in the mid 90s. Um, I believe it started in like. 90s. I, actually, I don't know the date it started, um, but uh, it was a um, spectacular flop. Um, it had a 99% error rate. Um, it led to millions of dollars um, in lawsuits uh, because, as Adam said, you know, as advocates, um, as lawyers, we are watching and looking at the data as it comes in, and so what that meant was constant monitoring and when seeing a problem immediately filing lawsuits to stop it so um cross check led to um a lot of lawsuits a lot of people being removed from the roles um improperly um and in the end the state was forced to shut down cross check and uh um a number of cross check states who were in cross check just moved over to eric um which we was you know a good system to begin with um, so it is, you know, I think that the skepticism that Adam and I have about AVID is that um, we have not seen it work well when a state tries to go on their own. Um, what we have seen is when states join together to create something and pool their resources, pool their money, pool their data, you get something like Eric, which isn't perfect because nothing is perfect. But um, but Crosscheck was... Uh, was a really big, um, I think, uh, stain. Uh, what went wrong there? I mean, if Alabama was to have any takeaways from it, then you know, sec the secretary wanted to look at it and try to do better. Well, I think um, clearly the their data usage and matching um, systems were just completely, um, completely wrong. <laughs> so, uh, to all about it, to Adam's just, uh, points before um, the proper security of the data and the proper um, implementation of criteria, um, analysis of the data, um, knowing where people are going, you know, where they're coming from, um, how to, you know, to properly match um, and and ensure that the person you're identifying is the same person from the other state. You know, it it sounds um, easy, but it's not, and that's why it took, you know, I don't know how many, a couple million dollars in a few years. So it it it's when you when states have tried to do it on their own, um, it ends up having it seems it seems to be a lot of short um, shortcuts that don't really fulfill the needs in order to um, to um, be in compliance with the National Voter Registration Act. So um, again, it's just you know pooling resources is a lot is is you know you're able to do something you're able to leverage. Um, your leverage work together um, a lot easily, e more easily than than alone. Um, Adam, did you want to offer comments on Kansas? I totally agree with whatever with with what Sylvia said. So yes, 
And, and again, the, the whole purpose of this is expensive. It requires financial capital. It requires really, really smart, very unique data folks. It requires very, very smart and really unique election folks. And, and quite frankly, when done right, it requires the balance of care between adding appropriate eligible folks and making sure that folks that are not eligible anymore on the list are not on the list on, on that list. You know, that 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 balance is the way to make sure that the, that the appropriate, you know, th that actually improves the registration system. It doesn't you know, there it there's a, a removal of, of, of folks with with a, a push just towards integrity. That's a way to think about, you know, uh, you know, a benefit. But to me, you don't improve the system by just removing folks. You remove appropriate folks and you add appropriate folks. And this was the the way to make it happen. So and and other other systems that are set up to just slice and dice who they think their voters are. Um, it's just not an appropriate way of doing things. Can I jump in here a second, Stephanie? Um, I, I think there's a really interesting, if we get out of the weeds about the technicalities about how this is all done, I think there's a really interesting political philosophical um, conversation that's also undergirds all of this. And, and that's the idea about, you know, there was, we talked earlier about the Secretary of State in Alabama's like fear about moving to a national, Eric is a move to a national voter registration list, right? Um, and and, and by, by having all these states coming together to pull their resources and work together, we might have some efficiencies, but, but maybe that's what you're building to. The other side of this, by having a series of essentially bilateral agreements among states, what, what you're doing is pervert, preserving this idea of, um, of state-based um, work and governance as opposed to top-down national. And, and so I think there's, there's also this really interesting political undercurrent about where authority should be. So all of the, everything is yet to be seen. Um, Alabama could succeed, we don't know. Um, there's, there's a lot of warnings out there but so what, I mean, Sylvia, what are those warnings? I mean, from Common Cause's perspective of learning lessons from Kansas, what are advocates, voter advocates, election security advocates, what do we need to be watching for, looking for? Well, I think um, as you've pointed out, there's so much that we don't know. So, you know, really examining that information as it comes um, and that might imbibe in, involve having to, you know, um, submit FOIA requests, but there are certain information that, you know, the process, obviously we, um, they would not and should not reveal anything that would um, impact the security of the data, but um, information, all of the details that, um, that have been left out of those top, of those top lines are so important. So, um, you know, as, as more, um, as this process uh, falls into place, uh, getting more, you know, watching that information, watching what data security measures they they are implementing, watching what matching criteria they are implementing, um, seeing if there are um, shortcuts happening, and and you know, I think we all know. Unfortunately, Alabama is not a place where it is um, easy to get the voter rolls unless you have millions and millions of dollars. So um, it really is going. It really is involving the community groups who engage with voters who are checking their registration and and really tracking when there seems to be something wrong, um, and and you know and following up and looking into that. And that is that involves you know kind of boots on the ground organizers interacting with voters, interacting with people, and saying you know have you checked your registration um, and tracking when when there are problems, which we generally do. I mean, the reality is we hear about them because if there is, um, you know, um, a big issue, I think you've probably seen, in, uh, I don't know if you've seen the news in, in Virginia, all of a sudden a large number of, um, of returning citizens were removed from the rolls, even though they had had their rights restored. So that was noticed when, uh, you know, interacting with returning citizens and realizing, hey, there's a really large group of people that we're interacting with that seem to not be no longer be on the voter list. So 
um, it is it is being um, aware and, and really just following along. And it feels, um, to Adam's point, it, it just, it often, it feels wrong a little bit because it's a wait and see approach, right? But that's the way things are, right? We are watching and um, seeing if things go wrong and then we can respond. So if, if we start to see hints that all are not well, if we're working with, if the league is working with our partner organizations and we're beginning to track that there is, that maintenance may be tipping over into illegitimate purging. Um, what, what did, where do people take their concerns? What do they do with that? Well, I mean, I think first of all, um, you know, talking to the secretary of state's office with, is always number one. I think, I think, um, while politicians are polit, 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 politicianing, well, um, usually <laughs> election officials across the country just want to run a good election. They want to do good li list maintenance. So I think being in contact and recognizing that um, if there is a problem, it, it is most likely not intentional. Um, and talking to figure out where there, where are these things, where, where the error is and how to find a solution. And I think, you know, obviously if that does not work, um, then you move on um, to possible other actions. Um, but, you know, always being engaged with election officials um, to know what they're doing, to be in contact with them and, and be talking about what the best way forward is, I think is always the number one, um, the, you know, the first, the first step and, and not to assume um, bad intentions. This is a very, very complicated, um, like hard thing to do. Um, and even though we have, you know, supercomputers now, it is um, it is cumbersome and it takes time to figure out how to do right. And so I think um, just having that in mind um, when working with election officials. Go ahead. Building off the complexity, um, there is a decent amount of federal law that overlays state law and what states want to do related to voter registration. And sometimes um, as we focus, you know, there are pieces of HAVA that place minimum requirements for, for this work. There are pieces of the NVRA. Um, as I mentioned on DOJ's website, there are federal records retention acts that are separate from those uh, laws that talk about the retention of voter information and voter registration information. And I will say that, you know, some states don't always do a good job of even complying with some of the, the basic mandates of, of existing federal law. Um, you know, there's been a lot of litigation over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years on both Section 7 and Section 5 of the National Voter Registration Act. Section 7, where social service agencies of states are required to do affirmatively do voter registration at those state agencies. Um, and Section 5 is this requirement that all uh, uh, DMVs, the motor voters that Mitchell mentioned, uh, systems need to affirmatively offer voter registration services, not at just the, you know, the first time they engage and ask for a driver's license, but every time that there's an update or a change, uh, that, that request needs to be there. There's a decent amount of, of litigation and quick settlements, you know, that both Common Cause, the League, a variety of other different organizations have been involved in that, that indicate that many states have not been following some of the core and basic elements of federal law. And so really trying to figure out um, when we're seeing something that just is not working, how does what a state's doing lining up with the requirements of the NVRA of the Help America Vote Act at times, you know, the remaining parts of the Voting Rights Act? Um, and, you know, one of the benefits, again, of the ERIC system is that it contemplated and really did a deep dive as to how ERIC would interact with and make sure that states that were member states could comply with the NVRA mailings and maintenance, this maintenance process. Um, and, and with the, the new system, we really don't know what that means. Um, we, we, you know, they're also, you know, safeguards, you know, we're coming into an important, uh, set of both primary federal elections as well as general federal elections next year. Under the NVRA, you can't have 
list maintenance removals less than 90 days in advance of a federal election that means primary or state and so they're you know three months in advance of november and three months in, in advance of whenever alabama's primary is my i apologize for forgetting um no more maintenance if people die or intentionally remove themselves you can remove those folks but this but just sort of looking and seeing and matching and 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 sending mailers out and attempting to remove within those three month windows for federal and state you're not going to be able to do it although states miss up mess up on that more often than you would like to imagine so there are this is a complex area and so don't i would say for those folks that are concerned or see something that they don't quite understand ask for help ask for folks to look into it from you know both experts statewide and and nationally that know uh, no NVRA, no federal voting rights laws, as well as how that intersects with the important state laws that you all have. And I, I mean, think in all of in all of this, I wouldn't immediately assume nefarious intent either. Normal accidents happen in complex systems, which election systems are, and, and so I think there's a um, the, the first place to start when something happens is to talk to the state election director's office or talk to the county office. And um, I, I, I think these are good people trying to do good work for the public and assuming nefarious intent and, and jumping immediately to watchdog and litigation probably doesn't make the environment better. Yeah, I've definitely learned that um, the county officials can be very helpful. And if they start to learn that there's widespread issues among the citizens that they serve in their counties, you know, they can push it up. Yeah, and they talk to each other and they talk to the state and um, they, they're they trying to do their job well. And we really are coming down to the, the, the line on some of, some of these issues. I mean, somebody pointed out in a question um, that Alabama's administrative calendar has primary election absentee ballots made be av made available in January. So that's right around the corner. Sylvia, did you have something to add? Oh, I was just gonna um, just add that, you know, I think, you know, as Adam Adam said, you know, the federal laws, th there are so many laws and Adam, yes, I actually did in 2017 do a report on how all many, like half the states aren't in compliance with some part of the NVRA. Um, federal reports, federal, um, you know, uh, law is complicated and all of how these works work together are complicated. But, um, you know, I think that just highlights the importance of um, groups like the League of Women Voters, um, groups like Common Cause, groups who are interacting with the voters on a on a daily basis, um, because these things are very complicated and um, a lot of the onus is on the voters, unfortunately, to be checking their registration and um, constantly and, and you know, and maintaining that. So um, I think it just uh, highlights, um, you know, how, how important it is to have our volunteers and our staff on the ground um, working with voters to get them to understand the system. I wanted to ask um, Adam a question. Um, is something that we haven't discussed that I, I have noticed might be a red flag in the difference between Eric and Abbott. Abbott. Um, and you talked earlier about there being that bipartisan balance and that philosophical balance in Eric. And that is one thing that Alabama's government institutions are definitely not known for. Um, you wrote, um, you must include voices and leaders with an interest in both access and security, and that people working on new systems should be fervently nonpartisan in their approach. Um, that chances of that happening in Alabama is not very high. Um, what's the danger in that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that this is the the challenge with with and 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 the promise with with our democracy and our, our national system, right? In that uh, everyone should get access to that that's eligible should get access to the ballot. And they're electing folks that represent Alabama in a federal system. And so to, to me, making sure that there is this one person, one vote, and that, you know, people of all different political parties can have their voices heard um, is really is really essential. And many, you know, um, I, I totally agree with Mitchell, you know, that we, we you know, 
election officials at the local level and and so many of the the statewide election officials are trying to do their job they're working hard with limited resources um, and, and many times they're hamstrung from the decisions that their state legislature has made, good and bad, um, as well as the decision their, um, their elected or appointed, you know, leaders uh, have made. And, and so I totally agree not to assume uh, malicious intent, and, and oftentimes it's their errors, you know, and this stuff is complicated. And, and that's why, I mean, it, it is always good for election officials to work together, to talk to, talk to each other, to use the best evidence, the best experts, and, um, and to really think through how you make the entire system better. And the more often, the more you're in closed rooms with people that just have the same ideological bent as you do, the less likely you're going to get exposed to information, to evidence, and to systems that, um, uh, you know, you might not have thought about before, but but actually Im improve the process. And I mean, there is, there's also, you know, seemingly a real push um, Outside of AVID, you know, there there are activists that are pushing this new Eagle AI system uh, as an alternative to Eric that might uh, that that is being promoted as a way to promote mass challenges. Uh, the documented uh, journalists uh, folks have done some really interesting reporting on this Eagle AI system, and you know, the, the, when the framework is developed as, as, as purely um, from one ideological camp, um, uh, then I think it causes people to have less trust in the system. And, uh, and, and if, you know, if, if a secretary of state or a state election director can't show that something has been developed with a broad coalition of different groups uh, from different parties, from uh, different uh, communities of interest, including communities of color, voters with disabilities, um, young voters, old voters, military and overseas voters. I think you have to raise these questions of who is involved in making these decisions um, and and really, you know, sort of say, well, will you ask them now? What what feedback loop are you going to provide to them to 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 make make this happen? And so uh, I, I always am I'm a believer that you, if you have more people in the room from different ideological camps, you'll you'll tend to get a a better result uh and again that is why this system um i think under the eric system was was a better framework i mean and to be fair um to your point you know if it that that's true of both sides um if we approach this process only from a voter accessibility perspective and pushed security to the side that would be an equally flawed system um, Mitchell, did you want to weigh in? No. Okay, that's fine. Um, just so our panelists know, I will come back um, for you guys to have final words, um, but we do have a few questions from the audience that I'd like to get to. Um, some of them are very specific, some of them are broad. Um, somebody asked about um, the data sharing agreement that includes bank account numbers or statements, social security and driver's license numbers. And they were asking, why does Alabama need bank account numbers and where are they getting them? And this was in the MOU. From the registration side of this, I've never seen a bank account number associated with any voter registration file or process or form. So that's, that's just odd. The, the only thing I can contemplate is if people, if they're not isolating repeat payments when people are uh, renewing their driver's license and they like save their card number on uh, the DMV account, that's the only thing I could think about when I saw that, that framework. But to call it out specifically in the MOU that this might be might be shared and, and please keep it safe is like, oh, that's that's not a good thing, right? Um, another question, and none of you might know off the top of your heads, um, but they're wondering if anybody knows which states have left Eric recently. Um, there have been a few um, articles, and I can find uh, one that has the, the full list and share it in the chat. Thank you. 
Um, somebody was curious to know um, if having a physical server in the state of Alabama necessarily makes our data safer. Is there any advantage to that? Our data servers. I'm no IT expert. <laughs> I, I am also no IT expert. Um, Eric said that they did have, you know, that they had both a server and a backup server and they did not indicate where it was being housed um, uh, for purposes of uh, physical machine security. And so I don't know whether, you know, to me, um, you know, having having smart folks sort of identify both the physical security as well as how much you can talk about uh, the, 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 the server, where it's located, giving people... <laughs> More information about uh, potential ways to engage, obviously, is is the is the risk. You know, uh, I have a, a ten year old and a three year old. We don't talk about Bruno. I don't think we talk about where where and how to get uh, your server information. Uh, but you know, let I, I think that um, you know having having these choices vetted and and discussions publicly as to what's the right way of going about doing this um, by smarter tech folks than myself yes, is the good way. Um, somebody was asking about um, publishing registered voter rolls um, that they said they used to be published in the newspaper by county names and towns and that they think they observed that they stopped doing that years ago. Um, what are the national or state rules on that? I think I, I know of several places in the state that still do that. I, I think it's still done. I mean, this voter rolls and access to the voter rolls varies across the country. Um, there are some states where they are publicly available on the state website. Um, and there are some states like uh, um, Alabama, where you have to pay, I think, a penny a voter roll a, a, a person for an electronic version or a dollar a person for a paper version. Um, in general, in most places, the parties have um, are always provided access. It's whether or not other people are. Um, you know, it is a hard, I will tell you, I, I, I kind of don't know the answer to um, to whether or not they should be public, right? They've always been public in the, uh, you know, we've always been pro them being public in the past, um, but with uh, kind of the world that we live in, then technology allows these lists to go further and further. And now we, we do see people getting harassed. So um, I don't, you know, I don't have an answer to, you know, I don't know if Adam has a better answer, uh, but there are reasons for people to, for some parts of the, or um, officials, um, you know, can be hidden off the rolls, but um, it's, it is a complicated kind of issue. It's complicated. And I do know that some, um, some election officials post 2020 and, and stop the steal have been uh, attempting to advocate for rules and laws that allow them, uh, their families, and at times uh, election workers or poll workers to be appropriately removed to make sure that they are not harassed. Um, and I mean, to me, um, given the climate and the environment that we're in, we need to figure out how to support election workers, how to respond to these threats uh, directly against them and, and figure out how we, we make sure that they stay in their jobs um, and they continue to do the good public service that we know that they do. Um, and somebody said that we missed a really great resource um, in talking about reporting voter issues, and that's 866 Our Vote. Does anybody want to tell folks what that is? Sure. Uh, thank you for highlighting 866 Our Vote. So, um, Common Cause is one of the co leads of the Election Protection Coalition, um, which is a nonpartisan group, and I think um, around the country with uh, on, on the ground is, is, is um, Common Cause and all of our partners, including the league in a number of, in, in, in a lot of states, um, are on the ground helping voters. Um, and in um, in concert with that, there is a hotline 866-R-VOTE that has attorneys staffing um, at all times to help voters with any of their questions. Um, and and um, they are also in contact with our uh, volunteers and staff on the ground to, to, help, um, to help solve problems. So, um, 
you know, 866 vote is a is a great um, uh, resource, as is, is it 411? Vote 411. Uh, yes, we always direct people there too, so. Um, and I, I've used both those resources and they are both amazing. Um, I wanna go ahead and give everybody the opportunity for closing comments, and then we'll wrap up by giving Kathy a chance to tell us about some upcoming league stuff. Um, we'll go Sylvia Adam Mitchell. Sylvia, go Sure, ahead. so um, thanks so much for, for allowing me to join you. Um, I think, uh, you know, list maintenance uh, sounds very boring, but um, it is, you know, an important part of election administration. And just like every other part of election administration, it is complex, it involves so many moving pieces, and involves a lot of work on our election of our election officials to to do it. So I don't, um, I feel like it, it um, the latest kind of narrative around it is has frightened people. But, um, you know, list maintenance, it's, it's always happened and we, you know, and advocates are always watching and, and as, um, and, you know, we are always in touch with the voters to ensure that they are, uh, they know what, what their rights are and how to register and how to stay registered and check their registration. So um, I, I think I want to kind of allay fears. I think a lot of people are very scared of, um, of, of uh, those st states leaving Eric. And while, as I think as Adam and I pointed out, um, we think Eric is a great, is, is a better option. Um, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, work isn't still being done to protect voters and, um, and will continue to be done. Obviously, thanks to Stephanie, as well as uh, co-panelists, Sylvia and Mitchell, known ever, you know, Sylvia and Mitchell for a number of years. Glad to share the screen uh, with you all. Also, really want to shout out and thank uh, Kathy Jones, the League of Women Voters president of Alabama. Uh, done amazing work in her leadership, um, including, obviously, along with some of her key supporters, uh, some Alabama tools that can improve transparency about how this stuff happens. The Alabama Channel is uh, something that the league created to help improve um, transparency in uh, for state uh, legislative meetings by both recording all of these uh, oversight hearings and, and other hearings and allowing transcription services and for people to do word search choices. And it, it's uh, it's something that I'm really excited about. And I hope when there are hearings about AVID in the state of Alabama, that the Alabama channel will be a great resources for folks to go in, check and see what's going on. You know, I, I totally agree with Sylvia's framework that this is complicated. This is hard stuff. It's complex, but details matter and complexity matters. And, you know, we don't know exactly what happened with the Virginia list removal that, that occurred uh, just recently. But, you know, to, to me, you know, when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands and millions of voters, small changes about how you do this work matters for people. And when you think about the end user, when folks are removed and don't know it, and they should still be on the list, they show up to the election day, the polling place, and they're not on the list. And they, if they, if they haven't done the removal in the in the appropriate way, which happens, um, or mail gets dropped or disappears or other types of things, the impact on a voter when they're not on the list is is really really meaningful. As someone that served as a poll worker in the past, when they're not on the list, they get concerned, they get embarrassed. Um, they can be angry. And while there are at times fail safes, everyone is given the right to uh, fill out a provisional ballot um, if they think they're eligible to vote in a particular jurisdiction um, after the Help America Vote Act. But even with that fail safe, some people are, have a busy day. They see the, the longer form and they say, no, that's okay. I'm walking away from it. And, and so, like to me, I always try to visualize the end user in mind, the voter who's showing up, who's a legitimate voter, that if if the system, the purge and, and list maintenance system, whatever we want to call it, is over-inclusive and not keeping up with best practices, and it's allowing for a lot more folks to be removed that shouldn't be removed. And I'm not saying that's the case now, but we don't know about the, the current system, so we have to keep our eyes open. 
that impacts that voter at the polling place and how their personal experience is with the election and whether they're going to show up and to, to vote in the future. And so to me, I try to visualize what that landing point looks like for voters. Um, and we should all, you know, think about how these policies, these, uh, how the administration of elections really has that, that influence. Um, so, but thank you so much for being on listening and all the work and volunteerism that league members and volunteers in the space um, uh, do. So thank you. You're muted. I'll, I'll wrap up by playing professor for a second and um, say, saying what I would say to my students. The, the, the quality of what AVID ends up being is a, it's an empirical question. We don't have the evidence yet. It's too soon to know. Um, and, and from a bigger perspective, um, I, I, think, I think we have to be careful about the language we use that part of the problem in the environment we have right now is about demonizing people who disagree with us. And, um, and, and I think we, we just have to be very careful about that. There's to something that we said earlier. Um, I, I think there's a qualitative distinction between disinformation and political spin. And, um, and these are all things that I, I, I caution everybody to be careful about, but um, this has been fun. I uh, appreciate the work of everybody on this panel and um, really love working in the election space. And I think the folks who run elections in the state of Alabama are um, well-intended people doing good work and not paid very well. So um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to be done. So thank, thank you. you. So on, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Alabama, thank you so much to all of our panelists for being with us today and for teaching us. Um, I don't know if you see the comments, but a lot of folks are just saying they really learned a lot. So Mitchell, Adam, Sylvia, thank you so much to each of you. Um, the League is really grateful for your partnership in securing elections and empowering voters and advocates with good information. Um, to our viewers, hope for you, hopefully you understand more about the very wonky process of voter roll maintenance and the process of doing it well so that we can watch closely, ask the right questions to be sure that Alabama is doing what is needed to ensure elections are both safe and accessible. I'm going to pass it back now to the president of the Alabama League, Kathy Jones, to wrap us up. I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to our moderator, Stephanie, and our panelists, Sylvia, Adam, and Mitchell. This has been a, beyond my wildest imaginations. I, this is the forum that I've been wanting to have for several months. I started talking to Adam and Mitchell and was so glad to, to meet you, Sylvia, um, to be able to pull this together. And we wanted, when it was announced, you know, after Wes Allen um, became Secretary of State that we had withdrawn, we wanted to give space for the Secretary of State to be able to, to you know, to make this happen, but also realizing that we're going into a 2024 election cycle with a brand new system. So this is something we want all of our members and all of our allies to be aware of and be looking. And if there's, you know, we need to be bit vigilant and that's one of the things that as we go out there and all of us in Alabama are working with uh, citizens to get them ready to vote in 2024, we need to be vigilant and make sure people are registered to vote and that they have are up to date on where on their registration and including where they live. And that's something that people need to be aware of, that they have to update their voter registration if they move. And um you know, as always, don't just assume nothing's changed. Don't show up at the poll thinking you're at the right polling place or at the, you know, that you're going to show up. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to, and also always consider if you can be a poll worker. This is adding all of us working to um, help the election system. What Sylvia mentioned and others is that, you know, the system is under a lot of stress. It's important for us to all do what we can to make this election system robust and stronger and to be able to withstand the, you know, any attacks that are coming in. We need to have poll workers who are there to protect um, the voters. Um, as we go through this next election cycle, uh, where the League of Women Voters is gonna be monitoring the AVID system implementation 
And, you know, one of the things I'm really glad we mentioned, talked about 866, our vote, because that's, that's the mechanism that we can, you know, when you go to the Secretary of State's um, website, the only phone numbers you see are for fraud. But if you've got a voter problem, you need to call 866, our vote. That's, that is where you go if you're a voter having a problem. That's not voter fraud. It's a problem with, or if you've been denied, or if you see a problem. Um, and I would appreciate you also letting the League of Women Voters of Alabama know if you see a problem. And our email to reach out to us is um, admin, A-D-M-I-N, at lwval.org. And just if you see something, just drop us a line. I'm not sure, if, you know, we may go right to 866, our vote, but we'd like to be aware. And um, and also wanted to mention that we do have a voter services committee that uh, is meets once a month. And one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out how can we, you know, as a league, how can we do better to support Alabama? And so if you are in the local leagues, you know, please reach out to Julie Reese and, um, you know, let her know that you'd like to be a part of that. And as far as upcoming programs, um, Jean, if you'll drop the links to those programs, maybe you already have and I didn't see it, but we do have two other programs coming up in, um, both of them are in November. The first one is a disability transportation issues forum. And the second one is, and that's on, I think, is it November 6th? I'm about to look at, look at it, but November 6th. And the second one is a, is a forum that is focused on the maternal mortality crisis in Alabama. And that is on Thursday, the 16th. And what, we, what we're trying to do with these forums is to help people understand the issues that they care about so that you can hold uh, the people who are running to be your elected leaders accountable. If you learn about the issues, and be able to ask questions and figure out who you want to vote for. So that's why we're holding these forums and I sure hope you attend. And thank you so much. And thanks again for everybody coming out on a Saturday morning.